I'm Aubrey Larson. I am the coordinator for the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative. I actually work for the state of Utah's Community Development Office, and so the cooperative is one of the programs that I help manage. Uh, Jake, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Jake Powell. I'm an extension specialist at Utah State University in the Department of Landscape Architecture and Environmental Planning. And I know Aubrey and I work together. I work um, with a group called the Gateway and Natural Amenity Region Initiative. That's where the NAR comes from. Um, so I, I, I'm the current leader of that group. And one of the projects that we have worked on with Aubrey is, is the Western Night Skies Council, which we'll talk a little bit later about in our presentation. Thank so we're yeah. happy to be here. <clears throat> Thank you. So I put together a short presentation for today. Really, its focus is on advocacy, on some good talking points when you uh, go out into your communities and want to share with your neighbors the importance of dark skies. So hopefully that's what we can accomplish today. These are the six main points that I'll go through. So we'll talk about what's the Western Night Skies Council, overview of light pollution, why do dark skies matter, what can be done about light pollution, and then some advice from community advocates. Um, and then an invitation from us. So Jake will take over um, near the end and talk a little bit more. Okay, so Western Night Skies Council, what is this thing? Uh, so the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative and the NAR Initiative, we partnered to create this um, foundation for connection, communication, and collaboration among these 11 Western states in the US. Um, we wanted to make sure that people could communicate, that they could share best practices, success stories, resources, learn from each other, support each other around this topic of dark skies. Uh, we've met three times officially. Uh, there's about 40 people on the council. And then in between our quarterly meetings, we'll host a seminar series that just provides people with a platform for sharing what they're up to. So we've had a variety of different um, people talk to um, broad audience thanks to the NAR initiative. So I'm excited to see what happens next with this council, but it, it's kind of a, a test to see if this works. But um, so far people have been really excited to come together around this topic. Okay. So I'm gonna just start off with a story um, really briefly. So in 1994, hopefully that year's right, um, in Northridge, California, there was an earthquake and the power went out and a bunch of folks panicked and started calling 911 because they saw some silvery cloud in the sky. They didn't know what it was. Is it the apocalypse? Is it the end of the world? Um, it was the Milky Way. So really, um, I think this story illustrates a disconnect and um, a lot of us don't realize what we're missing out on scene. So the Milky Way, the aurora, the stars. So there's um, we've taken this step away from being fully integrated with our human ecology. And so dark skies are an important topic for a lot of different reasons, which I hope to talk about today. But I think the main thing is awareness. That, that would be the message I would hope to share today is that awareness is key. Okay, so what's light pollution? Uh, I like this simple definition. It's any adverse effect or impact attributable to artificial light at night. I think most of us can recognize light pollution when we see it. Um, here's some interesting stats for you. Um, about 80% of residents in North America and Europe can no longer see the Milky Way from where they live. And then about 1% actually know they're missing it. So back to that story about the earthquake. Um, shocking, really, that only 1% know they're missing out on seeing the Milky Way. Uh, so light pollution is growing at two times the rate of population growth. This image shows you um, light pollution maps from the late 50s to the mid 70s, 1997, projected up to 2025. Um, so uh, in about 50 years, light pollution will double. So we do know that it's increasing over time. Um, something I wanted to throw out there is um, thinking about satellites. So we know there's light pollution from the ground to the sky, um, but now we have satellites contributing to light pollution from the sky to the ground. Um, so that's just something to consider. I'm sure you've seen Starlink. Um, there's nowhere on earth that you can go and not see satellites at this point. So there's some new research that's come out um, that I'm happy to share with this group. Just something to be aware of. So why do dark skies matter? I'm going to go through some very basic reasons. This isn't comprehensive in any means, but 
I like to think of um, those reasons as economic, ecological, and cultural reasons. So these are some good talking points for you folks. Uh, so economic reasons, energy waste, uh, more stats. In the US, approximately one third of all lighting is wasted. About 60% of outdoor lighting is wasted as unneeded, overlit, or poorly aimed lighting. Estimates suggest that nearly $7 billion of energy is wasted as light pollution annually. I, I think all of us could think of something fun to do with that $7 billion rather than waste it, right? Um, here's one that's a little bit closer to home. Uh, for every $100 spent operating a dusted dawn light fixture, so a fixture that's on all night, almost 50% of that is wasted on light that never even reaches the ground or fulfills its actual purpose. Um, some more economic um, reasons, property values are tied to dark skies. So if you have a business like a drive-in theater, apartment complexes, other commercial properties, um, your property value can be affected by dark skies. Um, think of a drive-in theater, you don't want to have light pollution um, coming in and interacting with the audience experience, not being able to see the movie. Um, on the flip side, if you, you go on Airbnb, you'll see a lot of rentals that list um, dark skies and being able to see the starry night sky as a selling point for why you would want to come to stay. So that's, um, that's really growing in popularity um, and it can increase your property value. There's um, some numbers from, I believe, a, a development in Denver that actually started off with some lighting regulations for their development. And you can see that those properties are worth more than a nearby community which is too bad because housing prices are crazy right now. <laughs> um, another economic reason, astrotourism. So astronomy-based recreation and tourism is huge and it's growing. Um, it's big here in the Western United States. People will come from all over the world to come to some of these dark sky locations. So hopefully you've heard of the International Dark Sky Association. Um, they have a program where a park or a community can become a certified dark sky place. Lots of folks will come to Arches National Park here in Utah just to experience the starry night sky, which is really cool. Uh, for gateway communities, so NAR communities, this can be an economic development strategy. It's a great way to diversify your economy. Um, the critical part of astrotourism is it increases overnight stay. So if folks are staying overnight, they're likely going to spend more money in lodging, on food, on um, going out and having experiences, having some fun. So there's going to be more revenue. Uh, it's not seasonally dependent, so people don't have to come in the summer. They can come in the winter to have an astro tourism experience. And then it's a very sustainable form of tourism. You don't need a lot of infrastructure to integrate astro tourism into your local tourism activities. So that's definitely growing. So moving into some ecological reasons that dark skies are important, human health and safety. Um, I'm sure this isn't new to anyone that the blue light spectrum can be, um, so throughout the day we're exposed to blue and white light. So at nighttime, um, the sun goes down, our bodies know it's time to get ready to go to sleep, to produce melatonin. Um, but when we're exposed to light all day, um, think about your phones, tablets, computers, that light can be um, dangerous for humans. It can um, lead to sleep-wake disorders, other psychiatric disorders, even obesity and cancer progression. So there's definitely some health implications um, related to dark skies. Safety, I, I like to use this little image. So um, you see this big bright glare light, there's a fence, a bush, that's about all we can interpret from this image. But when this person shades, their eyes, they, you can see this person standing there at the gate that we couldn't see. So a lot of people will correlate more light with safety where that's not necessarily the case. Better lighting design is actually safer. Lighting that doesn't create glare, that is only lit, um, lighting the area that's needed. You'll be able to see someone standing by the gate or be able to walk safely to your car at night. So um, safety is definitely something to think about um, as far as lighting design, dark skies, there's some best practices that we can improve on that a lot of people just aren't aware of. Um, some ecological reasons, wildlife, um, this creepy deer picture. <laughs> um, almost half of animal species on earth are nocturnal. 
Um, wildlife use nocturnal light as a resource, as a way to interpret, um, to find information about their environment. A lot of birds migrate at night and they'll use celestial cues to know where they're going. So light pollution can alter behaviors, foraging areas, breeding cycles, and just like people, it can interrupt hormone, hormone regulation, reproduction, and even survival for some of these species. And I, I know this is a focus for a lot of scientists. Moving into some cultural reasons dark skies are important. So I love the phrase starry sky heritage, just thinking about ancient traditions and legends and stories and indigenous knowledge, that's huge. Um, we've used the night sky to form meaning, to navigate. Um, here in the West, uh, pioneer heritage and rural character, it's a sense of place. Uh, arts and humanities, there's so many stories about the night sky and constellations. And then thinking about what do we want to leave behind for future generations. So dark skies definitely has a cultural value. So what can be done about light pollution? It seems like a pretty challenging um, issue. Um, really, it comes down to these five lighting principles. And this is from the International Dark Sky Association and the Illuminating Engineering Society. They came together to come up with these five principles, which I'll just highlight briefly. Um, so Light to protect the night, we want lighting that's useful. So light should all have a clear purpose. Targeted, light should be directed only to where it's needed. Low light levels, light should be no brighter than necessary. There's lots of technologies that can help, dimmers, motion sensors. Um, number four, controlled, light should be used only when it's useful. And then color, using warmer colored lights where possible. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jake, who's gonna share some advice from some community advocates. Yeah, so like Aubrey said, a lot of the work we do is trying to help support communities with their efforts to be more dark skies conscious. Um, and so I wanted to share some thoughts from some of the communities here in the Western United States and, and in our region that have done this sort of work before. Um, so for example, there's a great little town um, called Helper here in Utah, very small. And their mayor you know, mentioned that, that, that education is a key. And that's one reason that, that Aubrey and I were excited to, to talk to you as fellow people that, that use or look to the night sky as a resource and see it as a resource. Um, we're probably more kindred spirits than, than, than we know. Um, this is a quote from folks in Ivins, which is um, out in Southern Utah, you know, getting started that there's resources out there, as, as Aubrey mentioned, the International Dark Sky Association works very hard to provide talking points and effort and research to help argue for dark skies. Um, another one, uh, this group, you know, they, they, you know, they're playing the long-term game. You know, this, it takes years to, to build this kind of support. And it seems really interesting or, or perhaps obvious to people that, that enjoy the night sky that it, it is a valuable and disappearing resource, as Aubrey mentioned. Um, so getting started sooner rather than later. Um, from a little teeny tiny town called Tory, um, helping people understand that, or, that a lighting ordinance, for example, in your community that, that organizes and governs light does not mean that you're not going to have no light. Um, it means that it's going to be in the right place and pointing down. So sort of dispelling some myths as part of the work. Um, this is from one of our partners uh, with the Kaibab Band of Paiute Indians. Um, you know, this, this beautiful quote about, you know, the more we unite our voices, the louder or the more people that can hear. Um, and they have, uh, Aubrey's done some work with Daniel and, you know, some amazing traditions and, and stories that revolve around the night sky um, that he's been willing to share with us. So there's people in your community that may have a story or, or something that ties them to the night sky that you might not know about and, and bringing their voices to the conversation is possibly, is something we found to be really effective. So this idea that, that bringing people together is a foundation for, for sharing stewardship of this shared resource. You know, as, as Aubrey mentioned, one of the really neat things about, about night or light pollution, it's one of the easiest forms of pollution to mitigate um, with, with some pretty low technology, low effort um, implementation, you can change the trajectory of, of light pollution. And that's not always the case with other types of pollution. Um, so as Aubrey said, kind of our final invitation, I guess, as, as we talk is this idea of how do we, how do we 
join forces or collaborate together, these communities that see the dark skies as a resource. Um, and so we, you know, a couple of, of resources and we can share these in the chat, um, darksky.org, um, the NAR initiative, we have a toolkit, um, the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Collaborative, which, which Aubrey organizes, has a great website and, and, and can share that. Um, and then this idea of, if, you, if you're really interested in this idea of, of preserving dark skies, the International Dark, dark Sky Association has local chapters and state chapters that you can join um, to help be informed, to, to join the conversation and add your voice to theirs. Um, and we, as was mentioned uh, by Liz, we, uh, the NAR initiative does webinars, we provide resources, and then the Western Night Skies Council, as Aubrey mentioned, provides resources as well. So our invitation is to, um, to help advocate for dark skies and this, this disappearing resource. We see it from, you know, the, the, Western, the, the Western region of the United States, we're a little too far uh, in, in lower latitudes to enjoy the Aurora Borealis, but we're, we're kind of, I guess, fighting for the same thing. We're fighting for a clear picture of, of these celestial bodies that whether it's the, the moon or the stars, uh, or the Aurora Borealis, I think we're all kind of should be pulling in the same direction. So if you have any questions, um, there's my contact information as well as the NAR Initiative website, as well as Aubrey's contact information uh, at the Dark Sky Co or at the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative. Um, so with that, we're we're happy to answer any kind of questions or or talk about any kind of topics that might be germane to both of our communities. Definitely. Um, thank you so much. This was just a perfect introduction and um, it, it really does intersect with uh, our interests in the dark sky and Aurora. Um, I think one of the ways is that actually you can see the Aurora um, further south uh, and more often than you might think. Mm -hmm. So um, especially in dark sky places. Um, so that's something that we can we can further collaborate on. Um, and then the other thing about growing astrotourism uh, that intersects with our interests in particular is that the sun is more active every 11 years. And so right now the sun is not very active, but it's, it's on the upswing. Mm -hmm. And so we anticipate that over the next several years, it's going to be more and more active, more and more people wanting to chase Aurora. Um, and of course there's social media. And now with the pandemic, there's, we're seeing a lot of increase in interest. And um, some of our friends up in Canada, uh, two of whom are our major leaders in different provinces who are our other folks ambassadors on the call here are already seeing that. And so um, that's just a one touch point. Um, but actually I, I wanted to open it up for Chris or Donna to ask a question or share your own um, kind of background of your community and concerns as well. Well, I can, I'll go first. Um, I live in a small town uh, of 500 people. It's very small. But uh, when you look at the, the website that shows the light pollution, it's amazing. You can pick out one of the farms that's just two miles from town on that map because there is just so much light. And I know when I was trying to photograph um, Steve a couple of months ago, that light was right in the way and that was driving me crazy and I couldn't drive, I didn't want to drive it a mile so I would be away from that light. And I would like to sometimes have a conversation with some of our neighbors uh, because they, I understand at calving time, they need to have the lights on and at harvest time, they need to have the lights on by the bins but you don't need those lights on all the time. There, there's theft, that's one reason that the farmers keep those lights on um, all the time. But um, I would love to be able to have a polite conversation and give them some ideas what, or express myself, what they could do instead of having those bright lights light shining up into the, the sky. Do you have any thoughts on that? That's a great question. Um, my grandpa was a rancher, so I totally get it. Um, 
I, I think one of the best ways to approach your neighbor is just around this concept of being a good neighbor, you know? Um, you don't want your light trespassing into their yard and vice versa. And then um, for these lights that are on all night, you just talk to them about, um, can they turn them off at like 11? Um, is there a way to shield the lighting? Is there a way to change the color temperature? I, I know these things can get expensive, but there's a lot of ways to retrofit lighting. Um, you can talk about what are their concerns. Just having a friendly conversation, I think is the best way to approach your neighbors approach small town leadership, farmers, um, these people that do need lighting. There are important uses for lighting and acknowledging that I think is important. Not saying, hey, turn off your lights. Um, I never wanna see your lights on. I, I think just approaching them in a friendly way is, is effective. And I, I think that's how you get to the core of why their lights are on and how you, they can adapt and, and change and adjust. Well, just the, the visual of those two pictures that you showed of uh, when that light was shielded. Like you can see the reflection off of my glasses. <laughs> uh, I know all about light and, and how it drives you nuts. And just th that visual showing how if you had that light just going down onto the ground, you could see that person in the gate. So um, if there's resources on, on lights, particular lights that can just shed the light onto the ground. It, like, do you have stuff like that on your website, the, like examples of, of lighting that can show that? I know the International Dark Sky Association does. They even have a fixture seal of approval program where they vetted different light fixtures for how dark sky friendly they are. Um, a lot of it comes down to whether that light is fully shielded. So is the bulb sticking out or is it fully shielded by um, some sort of shield, that's, that's really, um, I think the best place to go would be the IDA's website. But you're right, having visuals like showing before and after, um, that's really powerful because they can see, oh yeah, the, it is easier to see what's going on in the environment. And it doesn't mean the lights are all turned off. Maybe your neighbor wants to see your beautiful pictures um, <laughs> as well. And I don't know if Jake and Aubrey have heard of Steve, but Steve is a type of uh, Aurora-like unusual phenomenon that is actually lower, further south than usual, and um, basically uh, rediscovered by citizen scientists. So, uh, and, and fondly named by... Uh, Chris Ratzliff here on the call from the Alberta Aurora Chasers. So we've been heavily involved in the research around Steve and it's been actually a really great uh, story that um, has, has resonated with a lot of people. So um, yeah, it's really exciting to get into kind of the nuts and bolts and how we can connect to the specific resources because like, like Donna, like I have some specific questions but I'm not sure you know, is it this toolkit or is it that? Or who are my nearest um, international dark sky coordinators? Um, th those folks probably are the right people to talk to or may have resources. Or is there a forum that we're missing on how to discuss these kind of problems? Um, that's kind of, uh, yeah, one of, one of the areas of questions that I have. Um, Chris, how about you? What are your thoughts? Dark skies comes up so often in the communities. Um, and it's not always just dark skies either. Like, you know, we're, we're somewhat fortunate where we live. Um, in, like, Canada is so sparsely populated that our dense urban populations are really contained. So you don't have to go too far. I mean, I can drive, like, I, well, I mean, from my house. I'm, I'm in a suburb. And... I can make out the Milky Way from, from my backyard. It's not jumping out at me, but I can, if I'm looking for it, I can say, okay, well, that cluster, that, that's the Milky Way. Um, and then I can drive about an hour away and I can see the Milky Way perfectly clear. So we're, we're somewhat fortunate, um, but you know, we've got 4 million people who don't even realize that they can travel outside of our cities to see that, right? Um, and, and rarely venture away from the city when it's dark out. I think a couple interesting stories though, like we had a, 
we had a major flood event uh, in our that that impacted our, our our the city, and it took the downtown lights out. Like the downtown was out of power for about a week, and you know the whole city wasn't out by any stretch, but that dense cluster of lighting was was out. It was on was not lighting up the downtown, and we had people flocking, photographers flocking to the downtown area to take those photos, right? Like, like that, that, that photo of the downtown without light with stars above. And it was quite, quite spectacular event. Um, I think similarly, if we're talking about Steve, um, Steve is interesting. Like when we're talking about the Northern Lights in general, we don't need as much dark sky to see the Aurora. The Aurora is actually quite bright relative to uh, portions of the Milky Way, but Steve itself is quite dim. So it can get impacted by, by urban lights a lot more than the Aurora can. Uh, and I've had that problem several times where I was out photographing and, and I knew there was, there was a really great event above, but I couldn't quite pick it out the, with the camera and, and the urban lighting reflecting off of haze in the sky. It was, it was ruining any opportunity to, to, to see it. So we do definitely experience that, that quite often. We're also fortunate though in Alberta that we have a couple of dark sky preserves. Um, and, and those are definitely leveraged as, a, as tourism opportunities within the province. I'm gonna write down this name, Steve, and do some research. <laughs> we can definitely Steve. send you stuff about Steve. Steve also is interesting because to the naked eye, it kind of looks um, gray, like a contrail from a plane, and it goes east to west. But when you have really skilled photographers um, and good cameras, you pick up uh, like a mauve color and also some green little fingers that are flitting about Steve. So um, it's exciting uh, as well, something something cool to see. And, and really actually a lot of the early photographs were, um, it was cutting across the Milky Way. So it was kind of photobombing the Milky Way. And it was those longer exposure photographs, I think that really helped bring it to light more clearly. Um, and especially like the science grade Aurora cameras were, um, the exposure was too short to really capture this very faint thing kind of very clearly. Um, yeah. So Liz, I wanted to maybe, um cover some of Donna's questions as well as mm -hmm. yours. Um, mm -hmm. I, in the chat, I just threw uh, the Colorado Dark Sky or Colorado Plateau Dark Sky uh, website, but I'm, I'll show it real quick um, just because I think it's it's a, a nice maybe resource for anybody. Um, are you seeing that? So in the tools and resources, you know, there's this, there's this good neighbor tab that kind of talks about how to talk to a neighbor perhaps, you know, or a community leader. And then that idea of lighting design, um, a great opportunity to kind of link to all these uh, outdoor lighting basics from the International Dark Sky. This is a really good, Aubrey's done a fantastic job of, of curating and bringing together a bunch of resources um, so you don't have to maybe hunt quite as far and wide. Um, so that, that cpdarkskies.org uh, and then looking under your tools and resources um, is a great, great one-stop shop to get you started. Awesome. Um, Thank you. I have another question about that. So um, especially in terms of, well, now that I'm in Washington state, uh, Washington really has the reputation of having cloudy skies anytime anything exciting is happening. But it's not entirely true. And, you know, when it's not cloudy, that's when you want to be in a dark sky type of place. Um, and actually near me, there's a small land trust. And so they both have, they have a lot of volunteer efforts um, and they have their own like private land as well as partnerships on public land, um, like a, a part of the forest, uh, national forest that's cross country ski area, that kind of thing. Um, I am interested in um, working on uh, measuring the the level of dark in this particular area and possibly um, you know getting it actually listed 
And my, my question is kind of how hard that is or where's the entry level point on that? Um, and I was thinking about it as potentially a project that like I could supervise a volunteer or an intern on. Um, and, and what do you think about that? I know they might not get all the way through listing it, but they, they might get quite far. Um, and yeah, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts or resources on that. Like, what are the easy first steps for, you know, you're not listing a whole national park, but, you know, maybe it's a teeny town or maybe it's a small piece of land. Um, yeah. So your, so your question is, how do you measure sky quality, right? Um, no, it's more about the big picture of, is that project a feasible small project? Um, or does it get, <laughs> you know, what's the entry level project for quantifying the dark skies in a specific small place? I, I think your question is probably best for John Barentine at the International Dark Sky Association. He's managing their Dark Sky Places program right now. Um, they definitely have different levels for, of certifications. So there's dark sky parks, dark sky reserves, dark sky communities. It just depends on which scale you're looking. Um, I know they, for different certifications, they'll require a lighting inventory. So looking at what's there. So if there's a lot of different light fixtures, that might be something you need a lot of people involved or find a university to come in and have some students do an assessment. I know um, there's some folks doing that. Um, yeah, it just really depends, I guess, is my answer. Okay, okay, great. Um, so Liz, Liz, to that yeah. question, there is um, um, in, on the website the, that I just shared there in their citizen, uh, citizen scientist tab in the tools mm -hmm. and resources, there are, uh, it does link out to some um, assessment guides that are a little more community focused and not, you know, they're not measuring the darkness of the night, but working with the community. Um, but there are some things that point you to maybe starting down that road of what it takes to, um, to do that, um, that whether it's starting the certification process or finishing it. Uh, that, but IDA does kind of run that ship. So um, I would point you to them as well. Okay. Is, is it something, how does that intersect with the gateway natural amenity initiative and the communities and, and that you work with? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's, it's sort of, I guess I can maybe riff off of what Chris talked about is, is a lot of these gateway communities are, are near public lands and they've seen themselves as very isolated um, small towns where you've got to see the night sky or you drove a few minutes out of town and you could see it as well as anywhere else. Um, there's tremendous growth pressure on gateway communities and maybe you're seeing that in where you're at in Canada that, that um, one subdivision or, or, or building at a time that, that night sky experience is disappearing in a lot of our gateway communities. And Chris, maybe you're seeing that in your town where it's growing, right? There's people coming, they're building and they're lighting things up because that is, we want, we want the night to be uh, lively or, or we perceive it as more safe um, to, to dump a bunch of light on top of our communities. And so the night skies that we see now are not necessarily going to be there forever unless we make choices in our planning and building that will preserve those. Um, and so what, what we're talking about with a lot of gateway communities is, is this is an asset that is easy to preserve, relatively easy to preserve, but you've got to, you've got to, it's easier to go and do it right to begin with and have to have that hard neighborly conversation of hey you know could you could you change your lighting now um so that's a lot of what we talk about with gateway communities is this is a another asset in addition to their recreation and their open space and their their kind of community charm is the night is, is an aspect of that 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 they can they can use to their advantage but if they if they grow if they outgrow that they're, they're going to lose that asset um if they're not very careful so that's kind of the message we we talk with gateway communities. And I think it's an important message with any community, really. It's neat that it's so multidisciplinary as well. So I, I'm wondering how that came about and whether these new initiatives are like part of a grant or just what's sort of some of the story about 
preserving the night sky. I mean, maybe it's obvious in Utah that that's a thing that is important, but um, yeah, maybe there's more story too. Yeah, I mean, maybe I can tell a 30,000 foot story and Aubrey can fill in some details, but really it's, I don't think there's been, it's really people that cared about a certain topic came together and started working on it um, and then approached some folks to help out. I know from like the NAR initiative side, um, it was really born out of some research that showed that these gateway communities were unique and they were struggling with unique challenges. And then a group of people who cared a lot about these places and what makes them special started rallying people together, bringing people in and saying, hey, you care about, you care about this from a recreation standpoint. I care about it from a land planning standpoint. You care about it from a socioeconomic standpoint or an equity standpoint. You care about it from an, an environmental preservation camp standpoint. You care about it from a dark skies standpoint. We kind of brought everybody together into the same room and realized we had a lot more in common than we had um, different. And so that's really where, where, and we all cared a lot. And so that's where it was really born. And from the, from the Gateway and Natural Amenity Region Initiative aspect, um, maybe Aubrey, you can tell a little bit of how the Colorado Dark Sky, um, or the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative formed. It's a mouthful, isn't it? It is. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I guess just a little bit timeline history for the cooperative. It started in about 2012, 2013 as a National Park Service initiative. Um, it was part of their call to action. And the original coordinator was a National Park Service employee uh, funded by the National Park Service. There's a cooperative grant that's still in effect until September, actually, of this year. So we're exploring some options for the future. But um, National Park Service has been a huge component of that, but they've seen it from the very beginning as they don't want to own this. They want to give that ownership to the stakeholders, to the community leadership, to the residents, to the businesses that care about this topic. So um, that's really cool to see that it's so collaborative and, and broad and so many different people can be involved. And really the, the Western Night Skies Council um, I, I approached NAR because I saw this gap. Um, it's very hard as a coordinator. I have an assistant coordinator. There's the two of us kind of running the show behind the scenes. Um, just how, how are we aware of what's going on and what people need? Um, and I, I thought, well, the NAR initiative is awesome because they have this huge listserv of folks all across the West. Why don't we just go big and, and try and create this, this support group for dark skies? And it's been really cool to see that. And in fact, we're missing someone from Washington. So Liz, if you wanna be part of the Western Night Skies Council or if this group wants to do a seminar, we would love to have you talk about the Aurora Borealis because that's part of this conversation. I think a lot of people will be really interested because we all care about dark skies for different reasons like Jake mentioned. Um, so yeah, if you want to do that, we would love to have, have you guys be involved. Yeah. yeah. Aubrey, come to your point. To, to make a difference, you have to operate at a certain scale. And, and what Aubrey mentioned is there's lots of groups like the Colorado Plateau Group that's, that's operating at a certain scale. And the scale Aubrey operates is, is pretty large. The Colorado Plateau is giant. The Great Basin is giant. Um, but there's smaller groups that, that really, you know, to, to uh, Daniel Bullock's point, we wanted to bring those voices together and operate at a regional scale that we can make a, make, hopefully make a difference, you know. Uh, to your point, like, does, does one little small town having a dark sky preserve make a difference? Yes. But then you put that National Forest Service land next to it and the state park and the next community over and you start to like build these, um, you sort of push that map of, of brightness back and, and create some big dark holes in the, in the nation. Um, but then there's some pretty amazing power to that. And so uh, we wanted to bring groups like Aubrey's together to, to, to have conversations that are more region scale. And, and as she mentioned, uh, your your group, your community is a voice that has similar interests that we've not heard, um, which is awesome. We're super excited to, to reach out and, and be able to maybe shake hands across the, across the cosmic aisle, I guess you could say. The cosmic aisle, I like that. Um, yeah, I wish we could all shake hands across the cosmic aisle. Um, it, it's also very interesting because our group uh, is, you know, pretty distributed and has ties to a lot of regional groups of amazing Aurora enthusiasts around the world. 
Um, and some of those strongest ties are with groups in, in Canada. Um, and those groups are really large and really active. So it, it potentially is very um, powerful to uh, either kind of mirror what you are doing or learn from each other and share some of those interests as well. Um, Cause I, I think, I think there would be a lot of interest. I don't know what Chris and Donna think, um, but, uh, or if, you know, the, the Dark Sky Association is international. Um, it, it doesn't sound like you guys are international yet, but maybe you, you want to be, <laughs> maybe you could be. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, but, we have international guests on occasion. In fact, we had someone from Australia last time we got together, so. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I sometimes think of this, you know, um, like bird watching. Um, you know, if you watch, if you're watching birds, and they're every year you go back to watch the migration, and it's this beautiful spectacle. And then every year there's less and less of them, and then pretty soon there's nothing left to look at. You know, if we're not very careful. And so just watching the night sky in, in whatever form, or, for t or taking pictures of it, um, I would hate to to be looking and taking pictures of something that's disappearing under our noses, you know? And so that's why I wouldn't say that our effort is, is advocacy in any, any way, shape or form. We're very much into partnerships because the solutions, as Aubrey mentioned, they're not drastic, you know? Uh, talking about your neighbor, Donna, like they don't need to turn their lights off or, or, or remove the farm in order to help you out, right? They need to put shielded lights that points their light mm -hmm. down or turn it off at certain hours of night or change the bulbs, right? We're mm -hmm. not, this isn't radical advocacy uh, to preserve something that's really special. And so it, it really, we think it lends itself to partnerships and, and education as much as it, as anything. And so, um, like I say, I, I think there's, there's a room for maybe your group to step into the idea of, of and, and Chris, you mentioned it's not, not quite as, as important because it's, you're dealing with a very bright, uh, powerful uh, event that we're, we're, dealing with more you know if you lose it it's it's gone pretty quick and so um I mean, the idea of stepping into that preservation or, or dark we're calling it dark sky development Aubrey and I are starting to to talk about developing the dark skies not just preserving it um and pushing back that light a little bit more and and you know stepping into that as as part of your guys' role or sort of educate people about you want to keep seeing this and want to, to pass this on this amazing experience under the night sky like we can't just light everything up um, as we've been doing in the, the for the past fifty or hundred years. I, I would certainly yeah. say it's not unimportant. No. <laughs> I, I didn't mean to mean to uh, dis uh, sound dismissive like that. Um, we can see it. It's not as colorful. It's not as bright. It's not as you know. There's there's a, there's a lot that gets missed when you don't have when you don't have dark enough skies. When the aurora has reds and purples in it those are very dim to the human eye um, and those easily get washed out when you don't have uh, when you don't have dark enough skies well i can say from personal experience i've seen the aurora borealis once i was in northern idaho and it was like i don't it was a spiritual experience almost and i like it's something i will never forget and um anyway it's you are you're doing spectacular work and talking about a spectacular phenomenon that very few people even fewer people have experienced and and i speaking for myself what an impactful you know moment for me as a as a young person to to experience that never forget it well i think we we also really like to increase people's chances for being able to see it and understand when they can see it which with technology now is is getting better and better um and you know there's also the intersection with citizen science and the ways that citizen science can help document the changing night sky i think and the level of dark which uh i definitely firmly believe that we have to pay attention to and uh, you know, it is rapidly changing. Um, and if we don't, you know, where will we be um, in 50 years? It'll be just harder and harder to see these things that we all love. So um, 
I also wanted to um, introduce Dr. Pat Reif, who's a professor at Rice University of Space Physics and uh, many other talents. Um, and Pat, I'm sure you have some interesting uh, background on um, dark skies or thoughts on this as well, possibly. <laughs> Yeah, well, dark skies are, of course, the bane of, of all of our astronomer existence. When I first <clears throat> came to town, my 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 brother bought a farm, a ranch out an hour from town, and that one of the one of the things he wanted was that he could see the Milky Way. And nowadays, you know, if you've got a really good cold front in the winter, you know, maybe, <laughs> but the city has just kind of grown around you, and that makes it really really tough. Uh, when we try to do our astronomy classes at our campus observatory, I mean, we can see the planets fine. It's just the nebulas kind of go away. And um, so, I mean, again, in a good, good cold front, you can see the ring nebula. Usually Orion shows up pretty decent, but <laughs> most of the rest of it is, you, you, can, you, can you see that? <laughs> <laughs> Very faint. Yeah, the aurora that I've seen from Washington was pretty like that too, but i um, hoping for more stronger activity. Um, Jake or Aubrey, do you guys want to talk about the dark sky as minor um, at Utah State? Um, that sounds very exciting as well. Yeah, Aubrey, can you, that, so it's actually the University of Utah, which is just down the road from us. So, mm -hmm. but maybe Aubrey, you can talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, it's very new. In fact, last year was their pilot year for the program. Um, I, I've had a couple of interns work with me that have both been within the Dark Sky Studies minor, and, and I, I guess they divide it into three different sections. So there's lightscapes, nightscapes, and then they'll do a final capstone project. Um, there is a webinar that we had um, I guess the director of the minor talk about it. So if you wanted to watch that, I can find that recording and put it in the chat. Um, that's a really good overview, but yeah, it's brand new. Um, I think it's interesting to, the question really is how, how are these students gonna take this minor and apply it in you know their um, future careers and professional goals and aspirations, which is really interesting to talk to these students about ideas. It, it's so cool. It's uh, multidisciplinary um, there's, um, engineers, arts, uh, all sorts of different programs around campus that have come together around this program. And I think that makes it very unique and I'm excited to see how it it grows in the, into the future. But yeah, that, I, would, I would watch that webinar to get a good idea about it, yeah. Th that's actually how I heard about you guys. So I really enjoyed that webinar. Um, and it's, it, it's interesting that there are you know, classes from this broad perspective, and then also that there's some um, actual economic, there's some actual jobs in this new area, it sounds like. So I don't know if, if you guys know more specifics on that, but um, sounded very interesting. Yeah, so Liz, I, I put um, a, a website, that's our, the NAR initiative, and it's our Western Night Skies Council, and that's where if you scroll down, it says Western Night Skies Council webinar series. You can watch that recording of, uh, of the, about the university for anybody that's interested. But it is kind of cool, you know, like uh, the seed of a lot of these future careers is, is some sort of education, some sort of specialized tool, right? So the University of Utah did a great job of, of seeing that need and, and stepping into it. Um, some interesting aspects to it, like Aubrey mentioned, is multidisciplinary. So... Uh, I, I believe it's housed in their planning department, um, which is a great place. But, you know, engineers, it, it sort of bridges a lot of the, the silos that you would have, you could imagine, right? Like, so how does a planner talk to a lighting engineer about, about lighting in a new subdivision or, or something? Or, you know, that, 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 and how does a lighting engineer appreciate what a subdivision or, or something, what some of the issues of planning a land use planner might might deal with it. So it, it really does cross a lot of those divides, which I think provides the students with a skill set to talk to communities, to to manufacturers and wherever they may end up, to be able to have that language um, and, and tool set and ability to talk across different disciplines, because it's not a problem that one discipline owns, and it's not going to be a solution that one discipline owns either. So 
I think there could be some jokes there too, like how many astronomers, lighting people, and planners does it take to like screw in the light bulb or something? Some really good yeah. Jokes there. yeah, I don't or, know if you guys have thought of those already. But or unscrew the light bulb. Yeah. <laughs> unscrew the light bulb. Correct. That'd be the light. That'd be better. Aurora has generated a lot of popularity um, in in our uh, specific area and we have people traveling driving their cars to one spot to watch the aurora they're leaving their headlights on they're basically creating a small area of light pollution um it's completely different scale from what you're talking about but it has a very profound effect locally for the, for those groups Again, it's, I think it's, it's beyond what we've got time left for here, but it's, I think, a very interesting topic. Yeah, some interesting social science going on there for sure. Yeah. Yeah, we need a little infographic on the light pollution you create and control yourself. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Do this, your part. It, yeah, it's and, a challenge. And, and it, it goes into like, how do you turn your headlights off? Some cars, you can't now. If you've got the engine running, the light headlights have to be on and there's secret codes and tricks and techniques that are manufacturer specific. It's very challenging. And then there's the other side, the safety side of it too. If there's no lights and you have a, a whole bunch of people driving around, that's not safe either. So uh, yeah, we need to figure out how to educate people and, infographics or you know that's what we need to get out there and share with people so that they can understand and just get an idea of what good lighting is and what's the the proper way um, to be out there with other people or the proper way to set up lights uh, in your yard so this is See? an awesome education thank you they, they, the freeways have now gone to cut off lights in in texas which is very very good and a lot of the of the the corporations and everything have gone to cut off lights but i have discovered that some of the biggest offenders are are automobile lots for new and used automobile lots they have lights that shine down but they reflect back off of these cars and go right back up into space yeah that's going to be a tough one as well. Um, I will um, turn it over to Jake and Aubrey if you would like to have a final word. Thank you very much for the presentation and talking with us today. We will put this on YouTube and get it out to more folks um, and we really appreciate it. Go ahead, Aubrey. No, I was waiting for you to talk. I, I'll just say thank you for inviting us. I, I love to meet new people. I think that's the most fun thing I do is being the coordinators. There's all sorts of awesome people that have similar goals that I reach out and I get to connect with. So thank you. Um, and again, I'll just re-invite you to the Western Night Skies Council if you want to participate or do a webinar. We'd love to have you. I think that sounds great. Yeah. Yeah, and I would just echo Aubrey's thanks for inviting us for you know, making a connection uh, and, and echo that invitation to, you know, for us to, to be involved with you and you to be involved with us would be, uh, you know, helps, I believe that, that a rising tide lifts all ships. So uh, the more we can work together and, and advocate for the same things, uh, the better off we all are. So we're, we're excited to have a new partner uh, in, in, in new friends across the, the, uh, the United States as well as in Canada to talk about these sort of things. So. Very cool. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. We'll see some of you next week. And uh, yeah, we'll, we will um, try and get your slides and, and distribute them if that's all right, um, and your contact information. And we really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Signing off. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.